from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program from people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and you want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is animals. This is segment one of episode 71. In our last episode, we looked at the conservation status of animals. We learned the language functions and forms needed to research and report on the conservation of animals. Well, today we look at the efforts that are being taken to help wildlife survive in our human dominated world. First, let's review some of the language we employed to report on an animal's conservation status. Now, these are some of the terms you're likely to encounter in researching the animal on which you're reporting. Beginning with the most severe, your animal may be extinct or extinct in the wild. This means there are no living examples of the extinct species on Earth. Or in the second example, none except those in captivity. The first case includes passenger pigeons, and all dinosaurs. Now critically endangered, the next level is critically endangered. Now this designation is for species facing an, an extremely high risk of extinction in the immediate future. Species under this category include the black rhino, the California condor, and the ivory-billed woodpecker. Try to say that, ivory-billed woodpecker. And um, here it is on your screen. You can see what that looks like. The international rating follows the critically endangered category with simply endangered, those with a high risk rather than an extremely high risk. Now this poster shows a number of animals that are endangered. These are only a few that could become extinct and they're from all over the world as you can see. Now, for the system used in the United States, there is only one endangered category, and that is endangered. An example of this is the spotted owl. Now, this means that if something doesn't change, this animal is likely to become extinct. This classification brings protective laws into effect and an effort to save the species that's endangered. In the 1980s, researchers found that the spotted owl is in danger of becoming extinct due to the destruction of its habitat. Spotted owls need old growth conifor coniferous forest to survive and most of that habitat has been destroyed by the timber industry in Oregon and other parts of the Pacific Northwest. Now laws went into effect that protected the little remaining old growth forest from logging and this action immediately stopped logging on a, the very trees, as it turns out, that the industry was geared toward milling. The marbled murrelet, as reported in our last episode, has now been added to the endangered species list by the state of Oregon. They also need old growth forests for raising their chicks. Now, another status that you may find for your subject is vulnerable. Now this would include animals that have not yet been listed as endangered, but will likely be put on the list unless measures are taken to save it. And those measures of course have to be successful. In the ESA system, this would be the designation of threatened. A good example is this sage grouse. The population of these ground dwelling birds has fallen as they lose grassland habitat. With this particular species, conservation groups, government agencies, and both federal and state and industries have all planned and worked together to keep the sage grouse population strong enough to avoid being listed as endangered. Now, there's been a great deal of cooperation here. The results have been positive, and this model of cooperation has been embraced 
in many areas. However, with the current administration weakening the enforcement of environmental laws, it remains to be seen if this level of cooperation continues. Now you may find the subject of your research is experiencing reduced populations. Internationally, this could have them qualified as near-threatened status. This is not an official designation under the ESA. Sometimes the reduction is seen in the universal population and in others it may be a local problem. For example, the roseate spoonbill. While no longer endangered, they have been affected by areas of mosquito control activities. Another example is the ruby-throated hummingbird species. Their populations have shrunk due to habitat loss in the part of their migration habitat. Now you may find that the population of your animal that you're researching is stable. Now this is actually good news as long as their populations are healthy to begin with. An example is the Arctic tern. Stable is not an official designation in either system of listing. It could be under the international designation of least concern. The same can be said of your animal if it's said to be common. Now that's good news if a species is common when they're plentiful and well distributed. Some animals have the word common in their name. Make sure they're still common or numerous like the common guillemot. Now, even with some species that are common today, it's worth noting if they were threatened or endangered in the past and what brought about their recovery. Let's see some of those descriptive words again. Um, extinct, uh, let's see. Actually, we'll just have to remember those words. Remember, we started with extinct and then we had critically endangered or endangered, vulnerable or threatened, near threatened, stable or common, is making a comeback or is recovering. Now these are terms you're likely to use in reporting on the conservation status of the animal you're researching. Let's learn about the actions that are being taken to protect wildlife and the major participants in that action. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment two of episode 71. Now while you have to go out into the ocean to see some coastal birds, you don't have to charter a boat to see gulls. Off the shores of rocky outcroppings like those in Oregon, Washington, and California, gulls are often seen when looking out into the ocean. There seem to be few rocks without seagulls present. Now they seem to be present on every beach and most gulls are not shy around people. Seagulls seem to be plentiful, so it's easy to dismiss them as just a seagull. It's important to remember that there are many species of seagulls and not all of them are common or numerous. Now we think of gulls always living on the beach, but gulls are often encountered inland. Some abide in both habitats, living part of the year by the sea and the other months well inland, migrating between the different habitats. Now many species of seagulls find protection on sea islands, sometimes sheer rocks in the ocean on which they lay their eggs and raise their young. Some of the gulls are also notorious for stealing the eggs of other shorebird uh, species. Seagulls provide the distinct medium pitch call that is so much a part You've of the coastal experience. Their wings are exquisitely designed for staying aloft on the wind current, as well as making those sharp turns and swoops that they make when they're flying. Seagulls inspired writer Richard Bach to create Jonathan Livingston Seagull, a beautiful and soulful story alluding to human potential. It's a type of quest story. Now his work was interpreted for the big screen and for musical creation by singer-songwriter Neil Diamond and Lee Haywood. Neil Diamond developed an entire concept album to the Jonathan Livingston Seagull soundtrack. The story and the music touch many people deeply. Now herring seagulls are the most numerous of the gull species. Herring gulls have been observed eating each other's eggs. Herring gulls even attack one of my favorite birds, the tufted puffin. Now these coastal birds, the tufted puffins, do pretty much 
amazing things. They're distinguished by the shape of their beaks. Puffins eat fish, and this wide beak will hold several small fish at a time, enough to feed their chicks. Now notice the tufts on the male birds. They grow these during the breeding season. The tufts distinguish them from the East Coast puffins. Now while puffins nest and raise their young in the coastal cliffs, they spend most of their lives in the water. When the young birds first plunge into that sea, that's when they're most vulnerable to predation by gulls. This is segment three of episode 71 of Ramping Up Your English. While gulls seem a bit scrappy and certainly able to take care of themselves, some bird species as well as other animals need help from humans. In our previous episodes, we saw a number of organizations listed that are dedicated to helping wildlife. Perhaps the most obvious is the National Wildlife Federation. The Wildlife Federation has a long history of getting people to connect with nature, especially the wildlife with which we share the planet. Now each year they publish a calendar that has award-winning photography showing wildlife. Now I'm going to show you a number of these uh, wildlife uh, calendars so that you can see what kind of uh, work they do. So here we see one and uh, actually just a note from my director, we're a little bit out of order here. This is the one we were going to end on. This is from the land, uh, it's called the Trust for Public Land, a very important organization. Here we have one also from um, the Ocean Conservancy. And so this is a, yet another organization that helps. Here's the Nature Conservancy. We'll be talking more about that one a little bit later in the program. And then we have one here. This is called the Student Conservation Association, an organization I didn't even know existed until fairly recently. You've probably heard of the Audubon Society. This is one of their calendars. And then there's also the Defenders of Wildlife. All of these organizations offer calendars. There's a couple more I want to show you about. This one is called the National Parks Conservation Association. They do a lot of work with wildlife as well as the scenery, of course, that you see in the national parks. And finally, our last one that I'm going to show at this moment is from the World Wildlife Fund. And of course, they do, as their name implies, work throughout the world to conserve wildlife. So besides helping wildlife by being a member of these organizations, the excellent photography can supply a force, a source I should say, of animal pictures for discussion groups. Now you may have a connection to the National Wildlife Federation without even knowing it. Have you read a magazine entitled Ranger Rick? That's one of the publications of the National Wildlife Society. Now, National Wildlife Society magazine serves a, a uh, older readership. And you don't have to stand on your head to read it. You can read it like this, okay? And this is a, a they do a lot of uh, wildlife-based scientific studies as well as efforts to support wildlife by preserving its habitat. Now, in this issue of the magazine, make sure I hold it up correctly. Um, actually, in, this, in the next issue that you see features a story about the return of American bison to the Wind River Reservation. Now, for most Indian tribes, the Great Plains Indian tribes, the bison held a central place in their lives, both for physical needs like food and clothing and the spiritual role as well. It's an understatement to say that the return of the buffalo, which was facilitated in part by the National Wildlife Federation, working with them and other organizations, including the Eastern Shoshone Tribe and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, was a major event for the Native American people who abide on the reservation. As one participant in this watershed event put it, the circle is now complete. Scientific staff and project managers from the National Wildlife Federation are often at the table with policymakers and public land managers to help them make informed decisions about supporting wildlife in compliance with federal and state laws. They also certify gardens, yards, schools, and neighborhoods as being wildlife friendly. They also sponsor a night of camping out in nature 
if uh, only in your backyard. Now, the biggest conservation organization in the world is the Nature Conservancy. They publish a calendar with high quality pictures of wildlife that it endeavors to protect. Now, um, this issue shows a cooperative effort to restore the quality of the Great Lakes. The Nature Conservancy began in the United States by buying up private land and repurposing it to conservation that supports wildlife. Today, the Nature Conservancy has a worldwide reach and employs scores of scientists, project managers, and wildlife advocates. Now, one of their more powerful tools for protecting wildlife is the conservation easement. This legal device allows owners of property to receive financial assistance in exchange for managing the land in a way that supports wildlife and allows the owner to make a living on the land. Now, the biggest threat to critical habitat is often development of the land into housing projects, areas that will have houses, shopping centers, and parking lots. Those developments exclude habitat, many important species, so ranches, farms, and woodlands with a conservation easement will remain being used as such with many owners managing their land for enhancing the habitat of wildlife with help from the Wildlife Conservancy. Now, both of these organizations advocate for policies that protect critical areas for wildlife and engage the public in educational activities and citizen science. They prefer a cooperative approach based on the belief that all people, whether in business or government, treasure the benefits of clean water and air and sustainable economic activity. Smaller regional and local organizations also take a role in conserving and restoring critical habitat. In Oregon, the Southern Land Conservancy, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, saves high value land from development using the same tools as the Nature Conservancy. Land purchases and conservation easements. Christy Mergenthal of the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy explains the main mission of that agency. Southern Oregon Land Conservancy is the local land trust. So we're into land conservation, uh, protecting the beautiful lands in southwest Oregon. Uh, we particularly focus on the Rogue Basin in Jackson and Josephine County, and we've conserved about 10,000 acres in this region. Wow, 10,000 yeah, acres. Yeah, we're, you know, there's, there's this beautiful term, solastasia, solastasia, and it <laughs> describes the heartbreak that almost all of us have experienced of losing places, farms, open spaces, places we played when we were kids, and they're altered and overdeveloped. You know, Southwest Oregon is gorgeous, and people will continue to move here. And For that gorgeous yeah, absolutely. Uh, land. And we want to conserve a little bit of that landscape, the farms, the ranches, the forests, the streams, the wildlife habitat. Mergenthaler made her comments on adventures in education on RVTV. Another regional organization with a scientific approach is the Klamath Bird Observatory. Executive Director John Alexander explains how the work of his organization began with an effort to preserve and restore avian life before it qualifies as an endangered species. The Klamath Bird Observatory grew out of a program called Partners in Flight. And Partners in Flight uh, in the early 1990s was developed as a bird conservation initiative out of concern that many of the land birds or songbirds, birds that frequent our bird feeders, were declining, especially migratory birds across the continent. And the idea of Partners in Flight was to have a very proactive, partnership-oriented conservation initiative that had a dual mission to keep common birds common and to reverse declines of the most at-risk species. And the nature of this was to try to do this before these species warranted listing under the Endangered Species Act, which starts to become very expensive and uh, problematic uh, as far as proactive conservation. And so many of the large natural resource management agencies got on board with Partners in Flight early on 
the U.S. Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, uh, many different partners like that really supporting and contributing these efforts. And so we began to work in this area of Northern California and Southern Oregon, recognizing its unique biodiversity to inventory and start doing long-term monitoring in the various diverse habitats that we have in this area. Starting really our data sets go back to 1992. Science director Jamie Stevens explains how the careful study of birds can tell us about the health of the ecosystem. Birds provide a really good indicator of the health of our environment because when we go out and we monitor birds we can monitor all the different species at the same time and because of their high metabolic rate and mobility they respond really quickly to changes in their habitat. So when we monitor the handful of species, each of those species is going to respond differently to different changes in the habitat. And by understanding, um, by understanding what each individual species is doing, we can get a good um, handle on how our environment is doing. Stevens and Alexander made their comments in 2015 on Adventures in Education on RVTV. And these are only a few of the organizations that are working to conserve restore and enhance habitat for wildlife and for people as well. This large-scale work has benefits for wildlife otherwise threatened by shrinking habitat. Other organizations help animals on an individual basis. When an animal is injured in nature, its chance to survive becomes seriously limited. A raptor that loses an eye or an eagle with a broken wing is unlikely to be successful as a predator. Organizations exist to rehabilitate such animals so they can be released into the wild successfully. One such organization is Wildlife Images in Merlin, Oregon. Executive Director Dave Sidden explains how Wildlife Images has an extremely high success rate in rehabilitating animals that are injured or otherwise traumatized. I think that we have the ability to slow down and uh, really concentrate on each individual case and we have uh, you know amazingly dedicated employees in the clinic area plus we have interns we bring in summer interns about 10 or 12 every year that add to that workforce and then 40 or 50 some volunteers that are dedicated to that so when you take all those caring people together and you give them the time and resources necessary to complete their mission. They can do amazing things. So a lot of what we do in that clinic area is almost magic. It's pretty amazing to see what, what goes on on a scale that we deal with. Boy, each release is, is amazing. It's sort of the paycheck for doing all the hard work you've done with all these animals. And of course you have failures and you have successes. But when you take an animal out like the eagle, I think you're referring to and release them. We uh, released an eagle on top of Wood Rat Mountain here locally, a golden eagle that came in. And that is basically the culmination of so much hard work and so much dedication. And it's amazing. I don't know how you could explain or describe that elation to somebody that's never experienced that, but taking that animal that spent a year with you probably and setting them out in the wild and seeing how well they do. And in this particular case, we were lucky enough to have a remote cameras and everything set up to capture that moment. And you know, to share that with individuals is amazing. And we wish we had that opportunity more often. It seems like a very natural uh, fit with the education and rehabilitation because, you know, the rehabilitation makes you feel really good about it and helping out these thousand animals a year is pretty amazing. It makes you feel terrific. But in the long term, the education is probably the more important aspect of what we do. But the rehabilitation allows us to do the education. Some of the patients that really aren't able to go back out in the wild become amazing ambassadors for education. So if you can take that life that basically, you know, each animal that comes in here is essentially biologically dead when it comes in. If you can save their life and put their life to an amazing purpose like education and letting kids get up close and personal and understand how valuable these animals are to us, you can change the world. And I think the education is just critical here. And I really am proud of what our educational department's doing. Each year, Wildlife Images takes in over a thousand injured or traumatized wildlife. Some have suffered accidents. Others have been owned as pets and have lost the ability to live on their own, just as their owners have lost the ability to properly take care of them. Whether at Wildlife Images for healing and release, or for the mission of education, 
These individual animals get the care they need here and at similar rehabilitation centers across the country. Support from the community makes this kind of mission possible. Support for wildlife populations also comes from zoos and wildlife parks. Now, Wildlife Safari in Winston, Oregon has the most successful captive breeding program for cheetahs in the United States and the second most successful program in the world. Over 200 cheetahs have been born here, providing a bank of genetic material for sustaining the species, and just in time, too. Cheetah populations in their native land in Africa have been declining due largely to habitat loss. Now, while wildlife safari can't control the habitat loss, they can at least preserve enough animals to repopulate habitat when and if it's restored. And that wraps up this episode of, uh, on Wildlife Savers, uh, episode 71. I'd love to hear from you and see how you're progressing with this program. Send an email to letscreatepro at gmail.com. Visit my website at letscreate.org for all the support materials for this episode. Just navigate to the episode 71 page. You can watch and even download all episodes of Ramping Up Your English at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Use the search box by entering Ramping Up Your English. You'll find all the episodes there. Ramping Up Your English can be seen in Ashland on channel 15 or 115 of the Ashland Home Network and in the rest of Southern Oregon on Charter Cable channel 182. Showtimes are 8 a.m. on Mondays and 7.30 p.m. on Thursdays. Visit rvtv.sou.edu for free live streaming. Showtimes will vary in other areas. Check your local public access and education stations. I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, and I want to thank my talented and dedicated crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you helped to make this program an award winner. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RVTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.